thanks for being here this evening. I'm extremely excited to introduce you tonight to Cynthia Franco, who has really transformed um, what intake programs in municipal animal shelters can do and can look like. This program is the first of its kind. Uh, I wanna thank um, Life of Riley Spring Point for all of their support with this program as well. Um, and just growing what it what intake programs mean in general across the country. So tonight we have intake to placement with Pima Animal Care Center's intake to placement manager, Cynthia Franco. And so um, help me to welcome Cynthia this evening. And Cynthia, if you wanna tell us just about yourself and um, get started on this presentation while people uh, trickle in, that'd be awesome. Yeah, thank you, Rory. Uh, so, like Rory said, I'm the Intake to Placement Manager here at Pima Animal Care Center in Tucson, Arizona. Uh, I started this position just a few months ago. Um, what has changed since my day one on the job? Um, we've kind of learned things, taken things as we go, and are just keep rolling with things as they come. Uh, so, I'm really excited to kind of share the approach that we're taking on Intake to Placement at PAC. So... Thanks so much. I don't want to interrupt you, but um, your audio is a little bit hard to hear. Oh, no. Uh, say something again. Test one, two. How does that sound? It's a little better. Okay. Feel free to stop me if it goes out again. Okay, I will. I'll jump okay. in if it, if it sounds a little bit scratchy or something. Perfect. Thanks, Cynthia. Take it away. All right. So just a little bit about me. Uh, I graduated from the University of Arizona with a bachelor's of science in veterinary science, um, as well as minors in Spanish and African American studies. I graduated in uh, 2016. Um, during my senior year of college, I actually started as an animal care tech here at PAC. Uh, so I initially started as a, a technician in the clinic department. So I was hired on for art surgery unit, so did a lot of uh, spay and neuters, <laughs> um, and then also helped in our triage department from time to time. Uh, in 2017, I became one of four foster coordinators here at PAC. I was initially hired on as our adult cat foster coordinator, but then later transitioned to focus on medical and neonate uh, fostering, just because we all know how busy the summer months get. So I transitioned to that. Um, and then just recently in September of 2020, I was um, lucky enough to take on this job as intake replacement manager. Um, so again, just a few months of this, lots has happened. So very excited to share what we've been doing. A little bit about PAC for those that uh, don't know about Pima Animal Care Center. We are located in Tucson, Arizona. We were originally built in 19. 68 as a rabies control facility. We are a municipal shelter for all of Pima County. Pima County ranges over 9,000 square miles and it serves four jurisdictions, which is the city of Tucson, Or Valley, city of South Tucson, and our Basayaki tribe. We have an intake of about 16,000 pets a year, um, but in 2020, would be we did see a decrease in that, um, mostly due to COVID and a lot of intake restrictions, um, but we are currently an open intake uh, shelter for all of Pima County. We are the only one, um, and our current live release rate is about 92.8%. So what is intake to placement? Uh, the overall goal for intake to placement uh, is to basically decrease a pet's length of stay in shelter or to completely eliminate the state of that has to have in shelter. We're doing this by being proactive with the pet services that we offer that includes things like our Keeping Families Together Fund, offering resources to families who are in need, anything that we can possibly offer to help pets stay in their homes. Uh, we're doing that as well as in-person admissions directly to rescue, foster, and adoption placements. Um, our goal for PAC that we gave ourselves for our intake to placement program was to reduce our length of stay from our current 11 days to six days or less. So that is what we're working towards accomplishing. Um, and why are we doing this? Well, we all basically 
know if you've ever worked in a shelter, animals that come into the shelter are more at risk to get any shelter-borne illnesses and um, have behavior declines. So by reducing the length of time that a cat has to be in shelter, we're basically also reducing the chance that a cat will get sick, as well as decline behaviorally. Um, so then we can also allocate the resources that we would uh, allocate for those pets to pets that are coming in and need more emergency care um, from us at PAC. So before I started as an intake placement manager, there was already a lot of things and programs in place to kind of offset the number of pets that were coming into the shelter, um, as well as helping them move through once they were intaked um, and in our shelter. So those things included our pet support center. They take in an average of 3,000 calls a month um, and help connect our community members to resources that can help pets in need. Um, again, this includes things um, and resources to obtain low-cost medical care, um, things like our outreach veterinary clinic that we are now offering for public members. Um, we also offer any supplies that they may need. So basically, our pet support is our front line in helping community members and keeping pets out of the shelter. We were also already practicing managed intake. Um, so this kind of hand in hand with our pet support center, we were trying to um, make appointments for any pets that we knew would be coming in, even if it's a stray, owner surrender, whatever it may be. We were trying to make appointments for those animals coming in to ensure that we had the capacity and the space to manage and care for those pets while they were here. We were also doing diversion, and for us, what that meant was empowering our admission staff to basically contact our rescue partners um, with a pet that they may be able to go into a certain rescue and contact them so that we didn't have to enter our shelter walls. With that, have you done? Yeah. yeah. So sorry to uh, interrupt, but it's it's a little bit difficult to hear you. Can you speak a little bit closer to your computer maybe and see if that helps? Will it help if I hold my mic up a little? No, it's using the microphone mm -hmm. on your computer, I think, not on your headphones. Let me see if I can change that. Does that sound better? No? Keep, yes, that did sound better, I think. Keep talking. Test one, two. Sorry, yes. guys. <laughs> okay, is that better? It's like a little tinny, but it's much better. Okay, sorry, guys. <laughs> it's All much right. clearer, but it's it's like when you, um, yeah, it's much clearer, I think. Okay, I'll just leave it at that and then feel free to stop me if it does anything else weird. Oh, that's so much better. Oh my gosh. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Thank you, thank you. Okay, great. All right, perfect. So uh, hand in hand with diversion, uh, we already had a long list of rescue partners that we were already working with. Um, our admission staff had those connections made with them. Um, we previously also had a rescue coordinator, um, but also lost her um, due to COVID um, and uh, job shortages. Um, so we, we unfortunately did lose our foster or rescue coordinator during that time, but we still kept those rescue partnerships um, and we continue to use them till today. Um, and then we also had a pro foster program that I was previously a part of. Um, currently it is uh, manned by three foster coordinators and they house basically all the pets that we house in foster at any given time and basically serve as the liaison between those foster pets and the foster parents and anything they may need in shelter. So for intake to placement, there's basically two ways that we know a pet may be coming in. The main way that we generally will know a pet is coming in is those pets and people that are contacting our pet support center and they then get scheduled for uh, appointments to come in. The other half is the ones are the ones that come in through our admissions directly and those are our unscheduled appointments. There are a lot of most of the time strays that people are unable to hold um, or strays that people find after having um, some kind of tragic accident um, that need to come in for medical attention. 
Um, unscheduled appointments also include animals that our animal protection officers are bringing in. Um, so our animal protections, our APS, um, is who I will be referring to them during this presentation. Um, and then the, the unscheduled appointments also include pets that are being transferred in from other veterinary clinics around town. Um, so those are basically the two ways that we are notified that an animal is coming in. And for the actual flow of intake to placement, most of the pets um, that we are identifying for intake to placement generally will be coming in through our pet support center. So during this whole presentation, I'm basically going to be talking about that whole uh, flow and how that kind of works, um, because basically animals that come in unscheduled then fall within some portion of this program. Um, and we'll, I'll kind of touch base off of that, but most of it is automatic. But I'll, again, I'll touch base once we get there. So what happens when someone contacts our pet support center? Um, they'll either submit an online survey or they will call, contact our pet support center directly. Um, our online survey basically asks um, some questions to kind of get help our staff get an idea of what that person may need. So whether they need supplies, whether they need medical attention or care, um, of additional resources, um, or if they found a straight pet. Um, same thing goes when someone calls into our pet support center, they triage the call and basically say, um, you know, how can we help you and your pet that you're calling about? Once our pet support center kind of triages um, what's going on with a certain call or survey answer, they will be the ones that basically designate or choose um, our pet candidates for intake to placement. Um, if they are not intake to placement candidates, these are very far and few in between, uh, but most of the times they won't qualify because they need to come in for immediate medical attention um, or have some kind of severe behavior um, that need to be that, that needs to be addressed. So those um, that don't qualify for intake to placement will basically get an intake appointment immediately. Um, and that's generally either same day or the next day, just depending on the situation. And just because we say at the time of the call, a pet is not eligible for intake to placement does not mean that it might not be once the pet is actually here and our staff, staff is able to evaluate and kind of see what's going on with its medical or behavior um, doesn't necessarily mean that at first glance, if it's not intake to placement, it won't ever be a candidate for intake to placement. It's just not um, something that our pet support center is able to identify as a candidate. And then if a cat if a pet is a candidate for intake to placement, they will either do one of two things. Um, just depending on the pet and the situation, we may be able to do direct matchmaking for foster rescue um, or an adopter. And for those ones that we do matchmaking for, they will notify me directly. The other half, we have a separate process and that process then starts with our staff requesting a picture of the pet just because we have also found that a pet is nine times more likely to find placement if we know what that pet looks like, um, as well as if our fosters, rescues, and adopters know what that pet looks like prior to finding placement for them. So for the matchmaking aspect, um, we have both fosters and rescues um, that we do matchmaking with. Um, for our rescue partners, these are uh, pets that we know are either going to be accepted by a breed specific group. Um, we also have a lot of rescues that take in neonates, moms, litters, and a lot of medical special needs. So just depending on a certain pet, um, our pet support staff is also really knowledgeable on recognizing which ones these are. And if they're questioned, um, or if they don't really know if they will or not be direct matchmaking candidates, um, they'll just come to me and basically just ask, um, but a lot of the times they already have that knowledge preset so they know which ones may be able to go to rescue directly or fosters. Um, for a fosters that is mostly more of the moms and litters that people call in about or neonates. Um, so we have um, the knowledge ahead of time that those um, types of pets are coming in and then we're able to contact fosters even prior to those pets coming in so that when they are at our doors. We have a foster um, also at our doors directly picking those animals up. Um, so 
this little guy is an example of our matchmaking. Um, you say that is such a cute little puppy. Yes, <laughs> it is a very cute little puppy, but he also came with some medical issues. Um, but luckily, we also have um, a foster that takes in cute medical broken puppies. Um, so we were able to contact her and they came directly in 20 minutes after this puppy came in. Um, he had um, a broken arm and some other things going on, but they came, came, picked him up after he got a quick exam from our medical team, drove him home. Um, and he says uh, he appreciated that foster coming for him so that he didn't even have to spend a couple hours in the shelter, um, just had to get that medical exam from our team. And then off he went into foster. And he's currently in a pre-adopt home um, with a different family um, that these folks were able to find for him. So he's on the mend and will soon be adopted. The rest of our flow then falls into our pet support staff requesting a picture from our community members or whoever's calling in, whether that be um, just a good Samaritan calling in about a stray pet or someone who is surrendering the, um, their pet. Um, so once we receive the picture, we send them a link to a dog and cat profile that gathers all the information that they might be able to tell us about their pet. Um, so this mostly falls in line with most of our owner surrender questions, but also has questions that a finder may be able to answer for us. Um, so temperament, temperament wise, what they've learned while they've had the pet, basically ask them those questions so that we can gather a little bit more prior to the pet coming in. Once we receive those survey responses, we upload that information to Chameleon, and Chameleon is our shelter-based software that we use to keep track of all the animals that enter our, our system. Um, so those survey responses are uploaded into Chame Chameleon, and our pet support staff then tags them for intake to placement in Chameleon. And then we use a very magical online app called Zapier that directly uploads that information to our Trello board, which is what we're using as our front facing um, board for our fosters, rescues, and adopters um, to see which pets are eligible for intake to placement if we're not able to match make uh, ahead of time. So our Trello board basically looks like this. Um, so it has a few different list on the board. So the first one is our board introduction that basically helps um, community members, again, our fosters, our rescues and adopters, um, get, getting to know how the board works, um, how they can pick up a pet on this board. Um, we've also taken some dog, cat, child and home alone scores. So basically how well they would do with cats, dogs, children, um, and how well they would do with home alone. Um, so once they click on a card, they're able to also know that information. Um, and we also have specific labels that are unique to a pet. So if a pet has medical um, information that someone may need to know about prior to them committing to a pet um, or any special skills or programs that that pet has been a part of, um, that also is tagged in each of their cards. And then we have the two different lists of either cats or dogs at packs or cats and dogs in the community. So the cats and dogs at PAC are the ones that come into PAC unscheduled. So these are the ones that we don't know about are coming in. Basically our admission staff does absolutely nothing. Um, again, that magical Zapier app basically recognizes an animal that gets booked in with certain qualifiers um, and basically uploads all their information into our Trello board. And then the ones that our pet support staff is tagging then falls in line with our cats and dogs in the community. Um, and then in the how to browse this board, it basically explains all those two things of which two categories these animals fall in. And then the last list is our found placement. So we also put the pets that have found placement just because a lot of people say, hey, I saw this dog or cat that I was interested in what happened to it. They can easily go on there and also see that that pet, that pet found placement um, so they can help another pet in need instead. Once they click on a card, this is basically what they see. Um, so the picture of the pet that we have 
um, or have taken once the pet is here. Um, the labels that we've deemed, we currently have three volunteers going in and tagging um, the pets based off of what we know. Um, so again, this is all on based off of what we know. So it's either something that an owner has told us or a finder has told us or something that our staff has um, observed while the pet has been here. Um, so they go back and label those um, pets in each card um, so that again people can go in click on a pet card and easily look at it and kind of get a big picture idea of what um, the animal is about so for this dog um, we don't have a name it came in as a stray so it doesn't have a name but it has an animal id number um, we've learned that the dog or Either we were told by the finder or we've learned while it's been here um, that it's kennel broken, um, so does not potty in its kennel. Um, it does need a mass removal surgery, so that's tagged on there so that the adopter, rescue, or foster is aware that that will need to be taken care of. Um, and has an energy level that's medium to high, um, just so that they can also know that that pet's going to be a good match for them. They have the option to review medical and behavior notes ahead of time, um, again, just so that they can get a general idea of what that pet um, has going on. And then at the, towards the bottom where it says custom field, that's where we have our dog, cats, child, and home alone scores, as well as the size range so that people can also see how big the animal is. Um, just because we've also learned pictures are very deceiving. Um, so we just like to give people an idea of how much um, or how big that pet is. Um, and then uh, the scores. Um, that we use the scores um, when they click on that card for dog, cat, child, and home alone scores, they basically can see what each score means. So whether a dog or cat um, would do better as the only pet in the home, or if they've lived successfully with other dogs and cats and can be a great candidate for living with those sets of pets or children, um, as well as how well they would do home alone. If we don't have that information um, in anything that we've learned from a finder, or an owner, um, then that uh, field would just be blank or it would say unknown because we don't have that information um, and we haven't gathered that information while the pet has been with us. And then what happens after a foster or a rescue or an adopter sees a pet on that board and says, I want that pet? They are instructed to email pack.placement at pima.gov. This is a mailbox that myself and one other person um, is able to access um, for that. They just basically email us with who they are interested. Um, and then we kind of work with them to coordinate a pickup with a pet support appointment. Um, so if the pets are out in the community, then we go ahead and just coordinate an appointment for them to come in and then have either the foster, rescue, or adopter pick up at that time of the appointment. And then at the appointment, that pet gets vac vaccinated, microchipped, um, and depending on where it's going um, will depend on also the additional steps that we take. So after it's found placement, if it's being adopted, then we go ahead and schedule that pet for spay and neuter, um, finalize the adoption with the adopter, and then say goodbye to that pet because there it has found its adopter and it's on its way um, to have its forever home. If it's a rescue, we just say goodbye to that pet just because our rescue partners then become responsible for taking care of anything necessary um, that our clinic has not done. Um, and then for fosters, we do have, again, our wonderful foster team that then is responsible for following up um, with those foster pets and foster parents with anything that that pet may need. They'll get spayed and neutered. And then our foster team also offers additional adoption support hand in hand with our on-site on adoption staff to help get that pet adopted from its foster home. So that pet, um, doesn't have to come back to the shelter to then get adopted. Um, we have those pets just be adopted directly from foster care. And then worst case scenario, what happens to a pet that receives no interest from any foster rescue or adopters? 
Um, most of the time, if they're being contacted, uh, if they're contacting pet support, they already have a scheduled admission appointment um, that's been scheduled out to give us time to find placement for that pet. Um, but again, if no placement is found, then they're still scheduled to come into the shelter um, so that we can help either the owner or the finder um, not have to hold on to that pet um, for unnecessary time. Then they're changed on their child board from pets in the community to then pets at PAC. Um, so they just get on that board for an additional 72 hours. After that time frame, if we still haven't found any placement, then we still have an adoption department that would continue to market that pet for adoption. We have a foster team that would then um, continue to market that pet for foster. Um, a lot of the times what we find is that during the time that a pet is on the foster, on the Trello board, someone may not be available, but then may become available later on. Um, so then our foster team would send that pet um, to foster. And then any pet in shelter that regardless of the time that they've been here continues to be a candidate for rescue. Um, so same thing if a rescue hasn't had um, an available spot for a pet while the pet was on the Trello board, but then after some time, after a week or so, they have a placement option, then they can still pull that pet for under rescue. But the 72 hours that the pet is on that board, um, we've placed that 72 hour timeline just because it's our goal to have pets leave here within 72 hours. And then data, I'm just gonna talk about data of how, um, of how successful we kind of have found this process um, going forward. Um, so the timeline that the data is kind of going to go off of is between September. So when I first started up till end of the month, last month in February. So within that time frame, we were able to keep uh, 713 pets out of the shelter or most of the time left were able to find placement within that 72 hour time frame. Um, so that included 277 uh, cats, 380 dogs, and 53 other. And the other um, included things like mice, uh, turtles, birds, um, a couple of potbelly pigs. So just a nice little cocktail of other pets that also came into the shelter. Um, in regards to our outcomes, um, we sent about 522 directly to foster or rescue, I'm sorry. Um, so a big bulk of these were able to get directly into rescue prior to the pets even coming in. Um, that's about three quarters of the outcome types. Uh, the second greatest one is our foster. So that's 177 pets that we're able to place directly into foster after a pet is here. And then we're also doing directly to adopters. Um, so, so far we've gotten 14 directly placed with adopters um, and we're currently working on a program to kind of increase that number. Um, just because of our policies um, at PAC, we're not able to do too many of these, um, but we're kind of re reworking that so that we can hopefully get more directly placed with adopters. Um, and then how much time are these pets spending at PAC before they leave? Um, most of them are either leaving the same day or within a 24 hour time frame. That's about half of them. So that's the big yellow chunk and then the lime green. Um, so about half of them are leaving um, within that time frame. Um, and then the second greatest one is pets leaving after the fourth day. Um, and what we found, the reason why that is, is mostly because we do have a straight time of three days. Most of the, these pets that are leaving to rescues that are out of county or out of our jurisdiction um, do have to wait their time um, in shelter before they can leave, um, just to ensure that if an owner comes forward, um, we're able to release that pet to them. Um, and then we also have an owner hold of five days that also contributes to that. Um, so if a pet comes in microchipped, uh, we don't necessarily like to send those pets out just because um, we have found sometimes it is a little troublesome. Um, so sometimes the pet does have uh, to stay here for five days to wait for either that chip owner to come and redeem that pet or a next of kin, um, someone to come and get that pet. 
Otherwise, then they get to leave after that five day. And then an, other things that also have contributed is um, pets that come in for rabies quarantine after a bite. Um, we find placement for those pets, but they still have to serve that 10 day consecutive, um, the 10 consecutive day quarantine here at PAC. Um, and then they're able to leave on the 11th day. And then we also have a uh, bond legal holds. Um, so these are holds that uh, the courts um, say are, are, the ownership is basically in limbo. Um, so the pets aren't necessarily ours, but they are legally unable to be housed with their owner. Um, so that is a minimum of 10 business days, just depending on courts and legal matters, a pet that is on bond hold may be extended um, so that those pets have to serve that time here in shelter. So that has also contributed to how much time a pet has to be here um, in our shelter. And then our average length of stay for these pets has been uh, so far 3.32 days during that time frame. Um, so our cats is uh, a little under three days, kittens is under two days, um, dogs is about four and a half days, puppies um, two and a half days, our birds are leaving within two days, um, our livestock a little over a day, um, and then other is 16, um, and that's again because of things like our bond holds and our quarantine um, that have contributed to that uh, other. Um, and with all that, there's always wonderful successes. So I just wanted to share a story about a little kitten named Giselle. Um, so Giselle was actually part of a community cat colony um, that a community member has been trying to trap as many cats as she can. We've been working with her for a really long time. Um, so generally when there's kittens in their area, she waits till they're at appropriate age. Um, to either continue to socialize them or we'll get them um, TNR'd when they're at appropriate age. For this little kitten, unfortunately, um, she was hit by the car hit by a car. Um, her commu the community member got her to a vet um, immediately, but the vet um, did diagnose her with permanent paralysis. Um, so she was unable to use her hind end and also didn't have any um, capacity to control her bowel movements. Um, so she decided that after um, that diagnosis, she herself was not able to continue to care for this little kitten. Um, so she decided to contact us to bring her in just to see what we were able to do. Um, and of course, we have a wonderful foster named Christina who was here within 20 minutes of these li this little kitten um, showing up and took her to foster care. Uh, Christina takes, uh, generally houses about 20 cats in foster um, by herself. Um, she's an amazing foster, um, likes to specialize in little broken kittens like Giselle. Um, so she took her to foster, um, but because we there really wasn't much that additional that we could do for Giselle, um, she decided that um, she wanted to find a rescue that could take her in. None of our local rescues, unfortunately, were able to take her, but she took it on as a mission to, uh, to herself to find a rescue that could take Giselle in um, that can help her lifelong. And luckily, she reached out to a rescue in Nevada that was really interested in helping Giselle. So we quickly became partners with them put them through the rescue process, um, were able to build that connection with them. And I think three days later, she was, um, she went on a flight through American Airlines where she got lots of cuddles from the attendees. Um, she flew in, everybody wanted to cuddle her. So she was flown um, to Nevada from Tucson. Um, and the last update that we got was her in her forever home um, back in December. So there she is and a look, the little present that she is under the Christmas tree. Um, so I think Giselle was, uh, I think my favorite success so far, just because of um, the different steps it took her to get to her forever home um, while she didn't even have to spend an hour here at the shelter before getting to those placements. So. After all that said, that's uh, all I have for my presentation. Um, is there any questions that I can take um, now? 
Do you need me to stop sharing the screen, Lori? Um, you can if you want to. There's a lot of questions in the chat and I can um, holler them out to you. Yeah, go ahead. Um, the first one is, is the pet support center just staff or volunteers as well, or is it all volunteer run? So it is two staff members right now that are currently the only staff members. Um, they do have occasional help um, from one other trained volunteer, um, but we do have two paid staff members dedicated for pet support. Awesome. And the next question is from Savannah Greenwell. Who gets first dibs on a pet? Adopters or rescues or just whoever calls you first? How do you balance that? Um, so for, that is a good question. So we did actually work on this um, in our Haas working group for intake to placement, where we basically kind of put a tier of, you know, who gets presidents. Um, our first, most of the time is um, pets being reunited with their owners that takes presidents. And then um, we go rescue, uh, adopter, and then foster. So that's the kind of line of priority that we have always followed. Um, most, of the, most of the time, rescue partners are the first ones to ask about a pet. Um, again, we're still working towards that adoption side, so we haven't really had many adopters uh, fighting with a rescue over a pet so far. Um, so we've been lucky in that sense. Um, but our line of presidents would be reuniting a pet with its owners, um, rescue, adoption, and then foster. Excellent. And then this question is coming from Evelyn Dale. Any problems with spay neuter surgeries when turnaround time is short? Uh, we haven't had any. And again, it's mostly because a lot of the times we know these pets are coming in. Um, so we're able to kind of rearrange and work with our clinic staff on coordinating when those surgeries are. Um, so for adopters, um, just like if an animal gets adopted um, it, within our shelter, um, those then get lined up for the next day. Um, but if they're going to a foster, then they coordinate um, once they're in foster. And then our rescue partners then get designated. Um, we did for a, a short time offer rescue spay neuter, um, but most of the time our rescue partners are really good about just taking care of that on their own. Awesome. <clears throat> There's a couple of other questions in the chat. Um, do you utilize self rehoming services in conjunction with intake to placement and how? Yes. Yeah, so all most of the rehoming. So um, when our pet support center gets a call or a survey, they will generally try a lot of other things. So they we do have a self rehoming guide um, that includes, you know, being able to contact rescues on their own, how to market your pet for adoption if you're trying to rehome them, um, kind of goes over all that, that steps. Um, so generally, when people either aren't willing to do that, um, or don't have the capacity to do that because they don't have a computer or access to the internet, things of that nature, um, then that's when our pet support staff is saying, yeah, well, um, we then can help this pet get placement by offering intake to placement for that pet. But generally, our pet support staff is generally trying to work uh, on other resources and providing those resources to community members um, to keep that pet out of the shelter. But if we exhaust all those resources um, and someone's not able to keep that pet with those resources that we offer, then we offer intake to placement at that time. You know, I just realized I put my email up here and it's wrong. It's only one S or one N, um, not two N, sorry. That's helpful. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Do you face any issues with stray hold period for found animals? Um, so, so far we haven't um, in the sense of people trying to find that pet. So again, our legal hold time is three days. Um, if we're placing a pet during its stray time, it's either to a rescue that's in town and um, they have the 
they already know that if an owner comes forward within that time frame, that they will return that pet so that pet can be reunited with their family, or we're placing them in foster um, where we're technically the legal owner of that pet and can have that foster return the pet um, if an owner does come forward. Um, so we have those um, agreements set ahead of time so that people know the expectations when they're taking a pet on stray hold. Um, and then after the stray hold is up, um, then our out of town rescues are the ones that are stepping in after that um, because then we become the legal owner and are able to uh, transfer that ownership to that rescue out of town or out of jurisdiction, sorry. Are the paid staff that you have assigned to other du duties as well? Or are they just focusing on this program? Sorry, can you repeat that question? You kind of glitched out a little. The paid staff members assigned on this program, do they have other duties as well? Um, in regards to intake the placement, um, the only person that is responsible for that is currently me. Um, so. I am the only uh, person designated for intake to placement. Um, so all of my time and is dedicated for intake to placement. Um, after I've placed a pet, um, then again, we have the foster team that's responsible for following up on them um, uh, and other staff that help with rescue. Uh, but in regards to the intake to placement program, I am the only one responsible um, for finding placement. Got it. <clears throat> a couple more questions coming in. Mm -hmm. How do you have the animal information available for a person who lost their animal to search through the animals that are not in your center to view? Um, so I think so, the question, yeah, okay, you got it. Yeah, I think the, so we do lost and found reports. Um, so if someone finds the stray that they're trying to find placement for, um, we still file a found report um, for that pet um, and they're listed on our pet harbor. Um, so on our website, they can go on our lost and found page and see those pets. Um, so it's kind of a two-hand approach where they're still listed as being found by someone out in the community, um, but they're also listed available for rescue of fosters to take in, in the event that an owner is um, not able to be found. Awesome. And another question is, do rescue groups that find pets on their own and want to pull them into their rescue go through this official process to satisfy hold periods? Sorry, can you repeat the question? I don't think I Do rescue that groups question. that find pets on their own and want to pull them into their rescue go through this official process to satisfy hold periods? So I think it's saying if a rescue group was brought up found animal in their neighborhood and wanted to bring them into their foster program, um, would they go through this process as well? Um, no. So for those, we would just file a found report for that pet. Um, it would be available to be seen for a whole week on our website as found. And then after that time frame, um, in Pima County, if someone is holding a pet for six days or longer, then the ownership um, is automatically transferred to them. Um, so we just have them, uh, that found report available for seven days. And then if no one um, comes forward and says, that's my pet, um, then in our system, we transfer that pet to the rescue. Excellent. And then um, Emily is asking, um, you may have said this in the beginning, but what is PAC's yearly, what is PAC's annual intake? So our average has been about 16,000, but last year um, it, we saw a decrease in that. So it was um, about 12,600 for 2020. Amazing. And maybe you shared this, but how big is Pima County? I think it's so fascinating. Yeah, it's a little over 9,000 square miles. So it's the second largest county in Arizona and the fifth largest in all of the United States. So wild. And um, yeah, it's just wild to me. Are there other questions that people have? Let me see if I missed any here. One coming in. About how many people are in your foster program 
Do you anticipate the number of fosters decreasing as the pandemic subsides and people return to work? Um, so in regards to like how many pets we have or how many staff members we have in our foster program, um, we have three designated foster coordinators um, to answer that right next week we'll be going down to two um, foster coordinators in charge of that program um, and we generally house more pets in foster um, than we do in shelter um, so I'm not off the top of my head I don't know the answer to how many fosters we have in our foster program right now um, but at any given time we generally house more pets in foster than we do in our shelter um, and then what was the second question? Do you anticipate uh, the number of foster caregivers decreasing once people go back to work? Uh, we don't necessarily, we went through a thought period where we did um, think that was gonna happen because when COVID first started, we did definitely see an increase and skyrocket in our numbers of pets that left to foster. Um, but we've been pretty consistent even after um, people were returning to work. Um, so about the time that I started in September was when a lot of people were returning to work. Um, and we didn't really see um, people, a decrease in the number of um, people wanting to foster um, just because then people kind of made us our goal to, okay, I'm returning to work. So what I want to do is help this pet get adopted before I start working. Um, so we didn't even see an increase of those foster pets returning to the shelter. Mm. It's really fascinating. Yeah. I, yeah, I've been interested in that sort of nationally and we've been trying to get numbers on that. So if you have numbers that you want to share with us about if your foster programs have increased through COVID and they're not going back down, I'm going to put my email in the chat because I'd love to see any numbers that you all can share with us. So I think that's a, a concern that a lot of people have and I'm not sure that people have really seen that. And Cynthia shared her email um, without the two N's um, in the chat. Yeah, I don't know how I spelled my last name incorrectly, but I did. <laughs> no, it happens. So there's one more question, which is, do you have a program for under-socialized cats and kittens? Um, so we do. Um, and again, those kind of fall within our matchmaking. So we have um, people who actually, that's what they love to do um, for both kittens and adults. Um, of course, it's a lot easier for our younger kittens. Um, we definitely have a larger um, amount of people that want to kind of just focus on that. Um, just because a lot of our under socialized kittens generally come in after um, eight weeks of age. Um, so they're already mostly eating on their own, pretty self sustainable, and all they have to do is focus on extra TLC for those kittens. Um, and then gradually over the years, um, we have kind of also seen an increase of people wanting to focus on our more under socialized adults. Um, and we also have in shelter support. Um, so we have a group of volunteers that also help under socialized um, cats in shelter with clicker training um, and kind of more positive reinforcement. Um, so then um, once they go into foster, um, then they kind of just take on those skills with them. Um, and the clicker training has helped entice a lot of fosters also to kind of learn that um, so that they can uh, practice that with the under socialized cats. So interesting. Okay, we have a few more questions coming in. Um, when you do found report six day hold, does that apply to pets with identification too, microchipped, tagged? Uh, yeah, so um, generally if a pet, if someone calls us and we file a found report uh, for that pet, most of the time people are coming in um, to get those found reports done just because we do offer um, microchips for pets that are unmicrochipped and vaccines. Um, so we do encourage people to bring them in so that we can double check that they don't have a microchip. If they do have a microchip, then our staff um, does kind of the legwork to trying to find um, who the most recent registered owner is. Um, 
So we do the left work behind that um, to make sure that we're able to reunite when possible. Um, but when that's not a, a reality or someone you know, hasn't kept their microchip up to date, um, most of the time the finders that are keeping the pets um, most likely uh, adopt them most of the time. Um, so we just make sure that, you know, there isn't another owner wanting that pet back. Um, and then that transfer of ownership goes to them um, if they're not looking to rehome that pet through the intake to placement program. That's so fascinating. So do you have data on how many of your finder fosters end up adopting if they don't, if they don't find the owner? We do. And I pulled up that data earlier today to look at it. And I can't remember the numbers. Um, but what a lot of people that just do found reports um, and don't want to do intake to placement is because they're willing to keep that pet after the time. Um, and because we've had a lot of people wanting to adopt um, after that straight time, um, we've also started offering um, spay neuter for found reports. So if someone wants to keep a pet and wants to have their pet altered, um, we offer uh, spay neuter services for those pets as well. Wow, that's so cool. Um, and then there's another question. Are you open to walk-ups currently or does everything have to go through the um, intake to placement process first? Um, so walk-ups in regards to like what sense? Like I think they're saying, uh, can someone just walk into the shelter to um, surrender an animal? Um, so for our owner surrender, so we're trying to do as many um, intake appointments as possible. So if someone's able to even hold on to that pet a day or two so that we can get them an appointment um, so to make sure that we have the capacity to take in that pet, we will do that. Um, but what we, we learned is there are some circumstances that just can't wait. So we will um, take walk um, walk-ins as you may um for certain situations um if we can't offer anything else um to help get that pet scheduled in the future um so there's there are still circumstances and exceptions that we have um for people that are just bringing in pets um, through our doors amazing are there any other questions someone's saying they're trying to send you an email but it keeps getting rejected um the correct email has only one n in front in franco so one we have time for one more question um this hour has flown by so thank you so much um the last question is, do you spay and neuter after the stray hold of three days if the finder has the animal or are you having them wait longer? So the three day stray hold only applies for pets in shelter. Um, so we and PAC have to at least wait three days once a pet is entered into our shelter system um, before we can, uh, the ownership then falls back to PAC. Versus if it's a found report and someone is helping that pet, they have to hold on to that pet six days or longer to then be the legal um, owner of that pet. Um, so we're scheduling those found spay neuters after the seventh day. Awesome. Do you have anything else that you want to add before we close up for tonight? Um, no, I just appreciate everyone coming this uh I told Rory, I was like, this is my first adult shining moment of doing a presentation <laughs> this big. So I'm very excited that uh, so many of you guys came and uh, watched this past hour. Um, I'm really excited. Um, and if you guys have any questions, feel free to bother me. Um, and I'm just excited about where this kind of program leads to in the next few months. Because um, it's just been amazing just doing this and helping so many pets stay out of the shelter. Well, we think that you're amazing and um, it's it's great to to get a chance to learn from you and all of the amazing work that you're doing, Cynthia. Um, and yeah, it's it's been great having you. I really, really appreciate it. This uh, session has been recorded. It will go out to everybody that registered in the next few days. 
Um, and we look forward to hearing more from you, Cynthia. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. And good night, everybody.